So tonight, let's prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord. If you would stand to your feet, I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful we can come into your house, God, that we can just experience your presence. God, what a joy it's been to sing your praises, to lift up your name tonight, God, and Lord, just to laugh and to rejoice here in your house, God. We don't want to stop there, Lord. We want to hear from you. Tonight we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. Holy Spirit, you are the true teacher of the church. And so we welcome you in this place, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord, and we'll thank you for it. God, tonight we'll do our part. We'll give you our interest, our attention. Lord, tonight we know that you'll do your part, opening our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Tonight, Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, also we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are having church. God, many Sunday night church services going on uh, in our part of the world, God, and we thank you, Lord, that you bless each and every one of them, God. Bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, for Harvest, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, for the way, God. We thank you, Lord, for the assemblies and four square denominations, for victory, God, and uh, just for all the great churches that are out there, Lord, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Too many to name by name, but Lord, you know them all well. And God, we pray that you would bless them as you would bless us. Tonight also we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. Lord, we would ask that you would watch over them, protect them, bless them, deliver them, Lord. And God, may they endure to the end to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. Tonight I have a subject called Upwards. Turn with me to Galatians, the fifth chapter. And in Galatians, the fifth chapter, we're going to find these Upwards. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16 starts out, and it says this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, in order to understand what it means when we say upwards, I just want to give you some direction here. Notice that he talks about two contrasting things. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse number 16, he talks about the Spirit, and he talks about the flesh. Now, we know that man was made from the dust of the earth, right? And therefore, we can say that our flesh is from the ground. Now, in relation to where we're at, the ground is always where? Down, right? But he says, I say then, walk in the spirit and do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if the flesh is down and the spirit was sent from heaven, then the spirit would be which way? Up, right? You guys are doing good. You guys are smart. Verse number 17, for the flesh, down, lust against the spirit, up, and the spirit, up, against the flesh, down. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Anybody ever struggled in this place, other than Pastor Dan, okay? A couple of you honest people, the rest of you guys, you're liars, right? We all struggle, right? We all have things that are hard in life that we have to battle against. There are things in the flesh, because even though we've been born again, how many of you know we didn't get a new earth suit yet, right? There will come a day that our bodies will be changed. Whether we go to be with the Lord or whether he comes, we will not all die, but we will all be changed, the Bible says. And therefore, there's a struggle that goes on right now. The flesh wars against the spirit. Down opposes up, and up opposes down. But we get to choose how we live our life. And if we walk in the spirit up, then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We won't stay down. Are you guys listening tonight? Amen. Verse number 18, but if you are led by the spirit up, you are not under the law. Now, the book of Galatians really was talking about how they went back to a law that was really the works of the flesh. And so he says, if you walk in the Spirit, you don't need rules and regulations any longer. You don't need that old covenant law, the old systems any longer. Now you need to walk in the Spirit, and you will fulfill the law because it was fulfilled in Christ, okay? That's another message for another time. It goes on, verse number 19. It says, now the works, everybody say works. The works of the flesh are evident, which are? adultery, 
fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Verse 20, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Verse 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things, everybody say practice. You know, practice makes perfect, right? We, we, we understand that as kids. So people who are perfecting their sinful nature is really who he's talking about. People who habitually go back to the same thing over and over and over again. They're working at getting good at it, right? Many of us, before we became Christians, before we were born again by the Spirit of God, were getting really good at sin. Right? I, I, I know I had perfected the art of tearing people down with my mouth. I, I, I had, at 15 years of age, perfected the sailor's slang. You know what I'm talking about? You know, cussing like a sailor? That was, that was me and my buds, right, hanging out. We, we had perfected certain areas of sin in our lives. That was beforehand. And he says, the people who practice such things, look at what he says, he goes on, the people who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we know that if heaven is up and you don't inherit the kingdom of God, there's only one other option and only one other way you're going, right? And that is down. So these downwards are going to drag you down. Eventually, if you stay on that path, it will take you straight into hell. And so we got to make sure that we're not on the wrong path. I don't want to go down. I want to go up. That means that I need to be headed upwards. And if I walk in the Spirit then I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, here's where I wanted to get to tonight, okay? All that was for this right here. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Everybody say fruit. Fruit. Now, I want you to notice something. It doesn't say the fruits, plural. It says the fruit. This is the product. This is the one thing that it produces. See, there are works plural of the flesh. There's many things that are going to take place when you're going in the flesh, but there's one thing going to happen when you get into the Spirit. There's going to be fruit that's produced in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is, look at what it is, love. Oh my goodness. Joy. Wow. We're all looking for joy. Peace. Oh my, in a world that's troubled like ours, we need peace. Long suffering. Or you could say, it suffers Long, my goodness, how, how can you endure? How can you stand up? Well, as you walk in the Spirit, it'll happen. Kindness, oh my goodness, you ever wondered how you're gonna be nice to somebody else? Man, they're just a fool, and you don't want them coming around, and if they come and talk to me, they're gonna get a piece of my mind. Well, listen, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Goodness, faithfulness, verse 23, gentleness, self-control. You know how many books have been written on self-control? You could go to the bookstore and find a whole section entitled self-help, self-control. It's all about self this and self that. No, listen, the real self-control is when you are walking in the Spirit and you put yourself under the control of the Holy Spirit. You let Him take the controls and all of a sudden you will be controlled. You will be walking in the Spirit. Look at what it says, against such there is no Once again, we don't need the rules. We don't need the regulations. We don't need someone to tell us to be good. We will be good because God is good and the nature of God will be flowing in and through us and to others around us. That's what this is really all about, is these upwards. And so in this series, each time we come together, uh, I want to just take a look at one of these upwards that will lead us up. The first of these words that we encounter is love. You know, there have been songs, in fact, if you look over uh, the the top hits over the years, love songs are like the number one type of a song you will find. People say, all you need is love. People would would go on to, to tell you that love can change the world and love this and love that. But love is really an up word. Love comes first because love is the most powerful of all of the up words that we find in the Bible. I'm gonna I'm gonna prove this to you from the scripture in a moment. See, out of love will flow all of the other upwards that we will encounter in this series. In other words, the joy that you have will come because there's love. The peace that you have will come because of love. I'll show this to you throughout the series as we go through this. Everything that you find, the kindness, the goodness, the self-control, all that stuff, suffering long, all of it will come from love. 
Here's why. Because love is the greatest power in the universe. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter number 4. Okay, I want to show this to you in the Word of God because it's good for us to understand where this comes from. Love is the greatest power in the universe. Well, wait, I thought force. I, I, I thought a nuclear bomb. I, I thought it was, you know, the economy. You know, uh, money can move things. Money can, can buy things. No, love is the greatest power in the universe. That's why the song says, you can't buy me love, right? Love is greater than money. Look at it. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse number 8, it says this. It says, he who does not love does not know God. Well, wait a second. How could we not know God if we, if we don't know love? Here's the reason why. Because God is love. Right there in the word of God, if you have a highlighter, a pencil, or something like that, you ought to underline those three little words. God is love. If you're going to encounter God, you're going to encounter love. If you're going to take a look at the nature of God, if you were able to dissect him and find out his DNA, the very fabric of his being, you would find love. God is love. Every expression that comes from God is loving. God is love. And God is the supreme power of the entire universe. And therefore, since God is love, love is the supreme power of the universe. Why? Because it's every expression of God. Everything that comes from God is love. That's why in Jeremiah it says, with loving kindness I have drawn you. A loyal covenant love. God has passionately and lovingly drawn all of us to himself. Look at what we can do through the power of love. See, if we know that God is love, and if we are walking in the Spirit, right, then the Spirit of God is God himself, and now we have God inside of us, therefore we've got love on the inside of us. Is everybody tracking? Everybody following me, right? Okay, so, so we, can, we can just come to those conclusions, that it, therefore if the Spirit of God is now living on the inside of us, and if God is love, then I have love living on the inside of me. And if I can walk in the Spirit, then I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, the lust of the flesh says I want to hate those people. And everybody has a segment of who those people are. doesn't matter the color of your skin, there's going to be those people that you don't like. doesn't matter your educational background, there's going to be those people that you don't like. It doesn't matter your economic status, there's going to be those people that you don't like. See, but if you walk in the Spirit, you will love those people. There's going to be times where we want to walk in the flesh and we want to be selfish, right? Because selfishness is unloving. But if you walk in the Spirit, you will extend love. Let's look at what we can do through the power of of love. First Corinthians chapter 13, probably the best chapter I would say in the Bible. If you want to find out what love expressed looks like, you'll find it in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. The apostle's writing and he starts talking about spiritual gifts in chapter number 12. Now we get excited when we think about the gifts of the Spirit. We get excited when we think about the power of the Spirit. We get excited when we think about speaking in tongues and prophesying and the miraculous taking place and great moves of faith and all the different things that come with the the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit can move powerfully and we think, wow, that's got to be it. That's got to be what it's all about. That's got to be the greatest thing. That's got to be, you know, just the, the crest and the crown of what God wants to do. Listen, God wants to do something greater than just the powerful gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those are all expressions of the greatest things he wants to do, but they are not the greatest thing that he wants to do. I'm going to show this to you in your Bible tonight. I know some of you guys are going, wow, this is new to me. This is kind of a pendulum shift. This is something different. But listen, God wants to do something greater, and that is to express his love in and through you. Because love is the greatest power in the universe. Greater than a gift. Greater than a miracle. Greater than anything else is the love of God. Let's take a look at what love expressed looks like. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 starting in verse number 4. And I'm going to read through verse number 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 starting in verse number 4. Look at what it says. It says love suffers long. And is kind. Two of the gifts of the Spirit right there. Just told you were expressions of love, right? How can I suffer long? I'm suffering. It hurts. I 
hate this. This is not fun. You know, I, I want to go lay on a couch somewhere. I, I want to go get one of those inflatable bag thingies that they're selling now and go sit on the ocean, you know, and just kind of just float through life on the lazy river. I just want to do my thing. I can't I just do me. I'm doing everything for everybody else. You know, I, I'm buying gifts for people. I, I'm, I'm being nice. I, I, I've just had enough. I want to do, but listen, love suffers long and is kind. It goes on and it says, love does not envy Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. See, the, the flesh would like to say, it's all about me. Look how cool I am. I want to exalt myself. And yet love does not envy. It doesn't want what other people have. It doesn't want their possessions or their things. It doesn't think, well, I wish if only I could be like that. No, love is not concerned with any of those things. Love is confident. And also, love Look at what it says. It goes on. It says, uh, verse number four, love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. If you battle pride, you need to get into love. That battle will be over. Because pride exalts self, love exalts others. Wow. Verse number five, love does not behave rudely. You know, sometimes people say, well, that's just my personality. I'm just a rude person. You know, we're, we're in California. I've heard people from New York say, well, that's just how, how New Yorkers are. That's how the East Coast people are. Listen, if you're loving, you're not rude. It will change the way you approach life and change the way you... Now, of course, there's quirks and all that kind of stuff. I get that there's personality stuff. But if it's expressed in love, it won't be rude. And it won't be perceived as rude. It goes on and it says it is not rude. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. You know, sometimes people can just push your buttons, right? But with love, they can push all they want and because you love... Push, push the red button as much as you want, honey. It's not going to do nothing. You just keep going. You just keep rapping on that thing. I, you're not going to get a rise out of me because I love you. And I'm not going to kill you. Hello. Come on, somebody. Goes on. Come on now, pastor. Praise the Lord. Thinks no evil. How many of you struggle with thoughts? See, sometimes we think, man, if I could only just get over this, if I could get delivered. Listen, the love of God will help you with your thinking. Because there are times where we think evil thoughts. The devil wants to shoot his fiery darts into our thinking. There's stuff that comes in. There's stuff that the flesh wants to put in there. We are inundated with images in our society. Everything is all about the visual and all about the perception. And there's stuff that's coming in. And if you battle in that arena, you need to let the love of God take over and you will be able to overcome. Because love is the greatest power in the universe. And love will even overcome our thought life. Wow. It thinks no evil. Evil is anything contrary to the ways of God. And therefore, when you operate in love, you can operate in the ways of God. Verse number six, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. See, there's sometimes where there are hard truths to accept from the word of God. Things that we were raised up in that we thought were acceptable because of the way society has taught us or the education system or the way that our family raised us up in. And there are things that we celebrate in society or in education or, or even in, in our families that are ungodly and that God does not want us to operate in. And it's tough for us to get out of those ways because they're like a rut we've gone through them so long that it has dug a path and now we're saying how do i get out of this here's how through the power of love it does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth so that when you receive the word of god and it tells you to do something that goes against your flesh and the flesh rises up and says but wait a second that's comfortable or i need that or or i want that or why is that wrong why is that a sin why shouldn't i be able to do that didn't they just make that legal in our state i, I really want to go after that and you know everybody else is doing it and 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 this is just the way that it should be and i don't get it why is god so strict why is god so harsh see when you love god it's not out of a letter it's not out of a law but it's out of love that you serve him and you rejoice in his truth you say oh lord if that's what you want i'll do it it's the same reason why every man in this place taking out the trash every time that it's trash day why because you love your wife enough to go and do it right because you don't want her lugging that stinky old mess out there because you you know your baby she shouldn't have to do that all the ladies said amen hallelujah all the men said pastor don't meddle right now please it's having a hard enough time before we got here Look at this, verse number seven, love bears all things. If life is unbearable, 
you need a baptism of the love of God. Because love will bear all things. You know, when, when people are crazy, you can bear. You can bear it because you love them. When the world seems like it's going down the toilet, you can bear it because of the power of love. It bears all things. It, it, look at what it goes on to say. It says it believes all things. Sometimes we find the word of God hard to believe. Sometimes we find it tough to stay in faith. And yet, if you operate in love, you can continue to believe all things. Love hopes all things. If you've lost hope, then you've lost sight of love. Because when you know you're loved, you can have hope. And when you know that the God of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who threw the stars into their places, the one who told the waters you can't cross this line, when you know that God loves you, oh my goodness, you can have hope eternally because God loves me. doesn't matter who hates me. My God loves me. And look at what it says. It says that love endures all things. If you don't think you can take it, if you don't think you can make it, by the power of love, you can endure all things. Just the first three words of the next verse, verse number eight, love never fails. Love never fails. You know, people, money, systems, all that kind of stuff will fail you, but love never fails. So let me ask you this question, what is love? What is love? If we're going to operate in love, if this is going to be pouring out of our lives because we are walking in the Spirit, then what is it? Sometimes people say, well, isn't love God? No, God is love, but love is not God. I know that's kind of a weird way of thinking about it. We would think that they'd be interchangeable, really, but no, love is of God, right? Love is the expression of God. Love is in everything God does, but God is the supreme being, and God is love. Therefore, we say love is the supreme power, right? Right? It'd be the same thing as if I had energy, right? Or, or you could think of it this way, right? Every body radiates heat, right? You could say that I am hot, but hot is not me, right? We, we all understand that type of a thing. So in the same way, God is love, but love is not God. Love is an expression of God. Love is the power of God that, that's going forth from him. So if we're to find out what love really is, we have to understand the expression of of God's love. Turn me to 1 John chapter 3. Now, now, all of us know the most famous verse in the Bible, right? John chapter 3, verse 16. It's a great verse in the Bible, right? Now, think about it this way. The address to find out the definition of love is 1 John 3, 16. Easy to remember, right? Hello? Okay, good, good. I thought you guys left. 1 John chapter 3. Verse number 16. You've got to give the preacher an amen every now and then, okay? Just, just so I know you're here. All right, otherwise I'll preach longer. First John chapter 3, verse number 16. Look what it says. It says, by this we know love. Some of the translations say, in this is love. In other words, I'm about ready to drop on you the definition of what love really is. Is By this we know love because he, capital A, speaking of Jesus, laid down his life for us. In other words, when you take a look at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you see love. That is love defined. If God is love and Jesus laid down his life for us and in this is love, by this we know the love of God. If you're going to define love, here's how to define it. Define it by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In this is love. By this we know what love is. And he laid down his life for us. And... Oh, the verse goes on. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In other words, if you're going to define love in your life, you're going to define it the same way it was defined in Jesus' life. Therefore, love is personal self-sacrifice, right? Jesus laid down his life for us. That was a personal self-sacrifice. And he did it to better our lives. It was for the benefit of others, right? Jesus wasn't doing that for himself. He was doing that for us. Jesus says, I did, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus could have, if he wanted to, just stayed with the Father in eternity, in his glory, right? In unity and oneness with the Father and the Holy Spirit, he could have stayed there forever and let us go to hell. If that was his desire, he could have done it because God does whatever he wants. But God wanted us 
with him. Why? Because he loved us. Therefore, Jesus, in the expression of God's love, came and laid down his life. He sacrificed himself. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. It was a personal self-sacrifice. This was not something that someone else did to Jesus. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. Jesus laid down his life on the cross. He is the author of creation. He's the one who turned water into wine and walked on water. If he wanted to, he could have walked right through the midst of them and they never could have crucified him. And we see that when they wanted to throw him off of a high hill, he did that. He walked right through them. But there came a day where he laid down his life and he let himself go to that cross. He let them nail those nails through his hands and through his feet. And the Bible says he gave up his spirit. No one took it from him. He laid down his life and he took it back up again. All for love. And it says, therefore, we also ought to lay down our lives in a personal self-sacrifice, giving of ourselves for the benefit of others. That is what love is. Love is personal self-sacrifice. It is giving yourself for the benefit of others. I want you guys to repeat this with me. You know how we make you crazy by repeating grace? I want you guys to repeat love in this place tonight, okay? Love is, come on, say it with me, personal self-sacrifice. It is giving yourself for the benefit of others. Let's say it again. Love is personal self-sacrifice. It is giving yourself for the benefit of others. I wanted you to say that because I, not only do I want to wake you up and, and, and make sure that you're still alive in this place, okay, number one, but number two, I want you to say that because there's power when you express something. And, and it, there's power when you hear your own words saying it. Think about it in terms of your life. Personal self Sacrifice, giving yourself for the benefit of others. You know when you have loved somebody, you've laid down your life for them. My goodness, I remember dating my wife. And because of love, in the middle of the night, I was up writing poetry. I was going and finding roses, trimming them out of the backyard, and driving all the way across San Timoteo Canyon at 4 a.m. to leave a poem and a rose on her doorstep so that when she walked out of her door in the morning and then looked down, she would see the love that I expressed for her. One time I waited for an hour while I thought she was coming home from work on her step with my guitar and I had written a song to sing to her when she got there. She came up with her best friend. Her best friend cried and she laughed. I don't know what that's all about, but anyways, I loved her and she married me anyway, so she must have loved it, all right? But we know love because of Jesus' sacrifice for us, and therefore we ought to lay down our lives. Think about this, okay, John three sixteen. let's quote it, right? Let, let's apply this, let's see if it works. John chapter three, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It applies, doesn't it? God so loved the world that he gave, right? He gave who? His only begotten son, Jesus. It was a sacrifice for God to give his only begotten son. What he asked of Abraham but didn't require of him in the long run, he did of himself. Why? Because it was a personal self-sacrifice for the father to break from his side his only begotten Jesus whom he loved. And I know that it grieved the heart of the father when Jesus died there on the cross, when he became sin for us and when God had to turn his face and pour out the wrath of God on his son Jesus. I can only imagine and yet because God loves us. He gave a personal self-sacrifice for our betterment so that we could benefit in every area of our life. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, here's another great verse on this, right? But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, there was a personal self-sacrifice. We didn't deserve it. And he could have let us die and go to hell and it would have been just he would have been justified in doing so. No one could have accused him of doing any wrong. And yet because of love, he still died for us. Even when we were sinners. Even when he knew that even after we were born again, we would still mess up. Wow. That's the love of God. And that love can be expressed in us. So how can we express the power of love? How can we express the power of love? John chapter 15, verse 12 through 13 says this. Turn there with me in John chapter 15. Once you see this one in your Bible, John chapter number 15, Jesus is speaking. He's just gotten done talking about the vine and the branches, how every expression of what we are comes from abiding in him. If we can stay in him, if we can, remember, walk in the spirit, 
then we will not fulfill the lust of flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit that will be produced, if, if we as the branches can stay connected to the vine and receive the life-giving sap of the Holy Spirit, then these things will be produced in our life. John chapter 15, remember, uh, we're going to read verse number 12 and verse number 13. Look at verse number 12. It says, this is my commandment, that you love one another, how? As I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, Jesus did that in the ultimate expression on the cross. But if we're going to love, then we need to love like Jesus did. We need to lay down our lives for others. That, you, know, you don't have to go to a cross. Oh, thank God that that's not what he has for all of us. There were people that did go to the cross. There were people that uh, did die. Peter was crucified upside down. Wow. The apostle Paul was beheaded. Uh, all of the disciples, you can read about how they were martyred except for John because they tried to kill him, but they couldn't. Pretty amazing. But you know what? God has called each and every one of us to a personal self-sacrifice that looks like Jesus' sacrifice. That it wasn't about him, but it was about loving others. And therefore, if we walk in the Spirit, we are to love like Jesus did. Then if Jesus is living on the inside of us and we're walking in the Spirit, then his life will be expressed through us. Is that right? Jesus was a giver. He freely gave his time. He freely gave his wisdom. He freely gave his resources. He freely gave his ability. Eventually, he sacrificed everything for our benefit. He gave his life, right? He, he gave everything. And therefore, if we are to love like Jesus loved, then we need to allow ourselves to give of our time, to give of our wisdom. The things that we have received, we should freely give. This works with anyone. This works in any area. If you're having trouble loving other people, I'm glad to tell you tonight that personal self-sacrifice, the giving of yourself for the benefit of others, works in every arena of life. See, Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 in the New Living Translation. Let's say you're having a problem in church, right? Which sometimes people think that you can have a problem with church people. Oh, yes, you can. Right? Just because people are in church doesn't mean that they're, they've made it, that they've arrived. We have not been perfected yet. We're all on a journey. We're all growing. And there are just going to be people that rub you the wrong way, that are your brother and sister in the Lord. You know, I've got kids, and, and my kids, there are mornings that they wake up fighting. And it's like, what on earth happened? You just woke up, and already you guys are fighting? And there's times where I put them to bed with a spanking because they are out of line, and they're unloving, right? And that's blood relatives, and we're all the family of God, and yet we think there's not going to be any trouble, there's not going to be any turmoil. Listen, we still walk in the Spirit, but we, we still have these flesh bodies, and sometimes that it gets expressed, even in church. Sometimes you go out in the parking lot, and you think, man, what's that guy doing? We were just in church. <laughs> Cutting the line. Somebody's telling them they're number one over here, and somebody's yelling over there, we were just in church. But listen, all of us are on a journey. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 in the New Living Translation says this, Above all, everybody say above all. Above all. This is most important. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Or other translations say, which is the bond of perfection. Wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? The bond of per perfection. Perfection meaning completeness, wholeness. See, we need each other. Uh, whether or not you like somebody or not, you still need that person in your life. Whether or not you agree with everything that everybody says around you, that's not the issue. You still need that person. Crazy, quirks, all that. You still need their, their gift. But guess what else? They need you in your life. Sometimes we're like that iron, sharpening iron. Sparks can fly when we come together, but there's a smoothing process that takes place. There's a sharpening process that takes place. Sometimes things can be chipped off of our lives and it can be painful when we encounter others, but guess what? He says, above all, clothe yourselves. That means put it on. You know, you get to choose every morning what you wear. You, you get to say, uh, I'm going to wear this shirt, I'm going to wear these pants or this dress or whatever it is. You know, you got some shoes that you like some socks or whatever it is that you wear, right? You choose what you put on. Sometimes we choose the wrong thing. On a cold day, we can forget to put on our coat, and what happens? We end up cold that day. Or sometimes on a hot day, we think the turtleneck is the way to go, and we realize, my goodness, I need to get out of this thing. I wish I would have wore a better undershirt. See, but in all of our lives, we have to choose to wear 
love. We've got to choose to put it on our lives, to clothe ourselves with love. We have to put it on each and every day. And as we do that, it will bind us all together in perfect harmony. See, when that person starts acting crazy, if you love them, then you will sacrifice your opinions and, and, and your ideas about how a situation might be handled in order to love them. Maybe somebody, you came to church and they sat in your seat. Because I know you guys, you all have your seat. I can tell who's in church and who's not in church because you all are creatures of habit. We all sit in the same spot every week, right? That is my seat. Don't nobody touch it. And somebody new shows up and they come and they sit down and they're all happy. They got their Bible on, they're ready to go. And excuse me, you need to move. That's my seat. I don't see your name on it, right? And all of a sudden, they got an attitude like they own the place. Where have you been the past 15 years that I've been attending this church, right? That's my sin. And if you'd been here, you'd know that. You can just scoot on over there. But see, if you're walking in love, hey, it's nice to meet you. Uh, don't you love that seat? I do too. But I also love this one over here, and I'm going to sit next to you. And Why don't we chop it up after church? Why don't we go get a burger? Why don't we go hang out? Why don't we go do something? See, that, that love will bring us together in perfect harmony. It'll be the bond of perfection. How about those of you that are maybe struggling in your marriage? And sometimes it's hard to love your spouse. Don't move, gentlemen. Just look straight forward. Just lock in. Shake your head a little bit every now and then. That way she knows you're listening, okay? Sometimes it's hard. You know, we're people. You get home, and the people that are closest to you are often the ones that we hurt the most because we put our guard down. And we can do very unloving things to the people that are closest to us. And, and, and sometimes we find it hard to have a good marriage because there's not a lot of love. We think it should be the butterflies. It should be, you know, giggles and, and butterfly kisses and all that kind of stuff every day, all day long, you know. Well, I, I don't know about you, but maybe you had that idea like I did, kind of naively going into marriage thinking everything's going to be roses, right? There, there's plenty of roses, but they also got the stems, and if you grab those things tightly, they're going to hurt, and you're going to bleed, and there will be a scar. That's love. That's what marriage looks like. Single people, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. But it can be tough. But if you're struggling in your marriage, it's time to start personal self-sacrifice, the giving of yourself for the benefit of someone else. Well, they don't deserve that. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said to me. And therefore, I am punishing them. Right? Sometimes we lock up. Sometimes we don't talk, right? The cold shoulder. We put that on rather than putting on love. Let me just put on this ice block right here. You want to rub up next to me, you're going to get that. <laughs> and yet, the Bible gives us every tool, everything we need to have a great life, including a great marriage. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we see this. Verse number 25, look at what it says. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25 says this. Husbands... Love your wives. How? How do I love her? Here's how. Just as Christ also loved the church. But she hurt me. Wait, didn't the church hurt Jesus? Didn't we sin? Wasn't it while we were sinners that Christ died for us? But wait, if I love her, if I open up again, I'm vulnerable and she may hurt me again. Didn't Jesus go to the cross knowing that we would mess up in the future? See, if you're truly expressing the love of God, you are opening yourself up to future hurts. But guess what? You can bear it. Why? Because you have the power of love. You can believe that you'll have a great marriage. How? Because of the power of love. You can hope for a great future with your spouse. Why? Because of the power of the love of God. Love never fails. But we've been failing in our marriage because we've been unloving. Love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her husbands. If you would simply give time, effort, attention, listen when she's talking, make eye contact, say, uh-huh. <laughs> Write her a note. Tell her you love her. Text her at lunch thinking about you. Kissy face, 100%. You know, smiley love guy winking with a kiss. Right? Load her up with those emojis or whatever those things are called. I don't even know. Love your wives just as also Christ loved the church. Guess what, ladies? You can do the same thing. 
personal self-sacrifice. First uh, Peter chapter 3 says that the man ain't doing what he should be doing. Just start to live the word quietly and with reverence and love. And as you do, he will see the word in and through your life. And he will start to obey the word. He doesn't have to obey you, right? Why don't you get in line? Why don't you go to church? Why don't you? Listen, you cannot nag him. That will only push him away. But if you love him, that will draw him in. And he will not obey you. He'll obey the word. And really, ladies, that's what you want. Can you say a high-pitched amen tonight? Love will overcome any obstacle when it comes to people. People may argue with you. They may argue with your reasoning. Maybe you're trying to share the love of Jesus, that Jesus went to the cross, that Jesus died so you don't have to die. And people may argue with you. Well, I believe in evolution. I believe in, in, in whatever, you know, some sort of uh, different weird stuff that, you know, we create our own reality. Maybe they have some goofy new age uh, goofball type stuff and you, you just bugs you because you, you realize, man, this is the word of God and this is the way it was and I see how, how science confirms the word of God and you're trying to argue and you're trying to lay down the scripture, you're showing them natural stuff. Listen, they can argue with that until you're blue in the face and exhausted and tired and out of ideas. They will argue you to their own grave, but they cannot argue with your love. They can't. Why? Because love never fails. Martin Luther King Jr. said, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Think about that man. Think about his life. Think about where he lived and the times that he endured. How did he endure that? How did he not get bitter? It was through the power of love. Wow. Just amazing. Richard Baxter said this. He said, if they can see you love them, you can say anything to them. You know, if somebody knows that you love them, you can come to them and tell them you're going to hell. And I don't want you to go there because I love you enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes people think, well, I just got to tell the truth. You know, I just got to say the truth. I just got to come out and say it. I, 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 I know that I would be unloving if I didn't tell them the truth. But listen, the Bible says to speak the truth in love, Right? There has to be an expression of God that's on that. Yes, sometimes it's tough to say tough things to people. It's tough to tell someone they're going to hell. That is not fun for anyone. That, that doesn't feel like love. But listen, if your child was out on the freeway playing and, and they were just hanging out there and you saw a truck coming at them, you would say, hey, dummy, get out of the road. You're going to get hit by a truck. Right? Why? Because you love them and you don't want to be without them. In the same way, when you see somebody headed downwards, whether they're in the church or whether they're outside of the church, it's time to start speaking up in love. Hey, bro. Hey, sis. I love you enough to tell you the truth. That is the path that leads to destruction. Let me show you the upwards. Let me show you the love of Jesus. Let me show you the love of a church. Let me show you the love of a friend. Let me show you the love of a brother or a sister. Let me let the love of God be expressed through me to your life. When you love somebody, you can say anything to them. John 13, 35, Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. In other words, people may argue with creation. They may argue with Adam and Eve. They may argue with Noah and the flood. They may argue with Jesus and his miracles. They may argue with everything in the Bible. But they cannot argue with a person that loves somebody. They can't come up against the love of God. Because love is the supreme power of the universe because God is love. And when we operate in that love, people will fall down before Jesus. Oh my goodness. There was a, a preacher who was traveling. As he was traveling, he was going and checking on people in his congregation he's riding his bike through the small town and the preacher had just moved in and so he's trying to build relationships things like that and as well he had a couple needs and so you know as he's riding around he was looking for deals on furniture and sales and things like that and came upon a young boy who had a lawnmower on the lawnmower it said for sale and so the preacher came up and he said hey son what's the price of that lawnmower and the kid looked at him and he said well you know what uh, I like that bike that you're riding on there how about a trade? The preacher looked at the bike and he said, well, sure, you know what, I'll trade you the bike for the lawnmower. That'd be great. I can walk. I don't really need the bike. It's a small town. 
I think I'll be all right, but I really do need that lawnmower for my house. So they make the trade, and the preacher takes the lawnmower home. And there he starts to pull on the string of the lawnmower, and it just isn't working for some reason. Just, just not happening and the boy rides up on the bike a couple minutes later and he looks like he's having a grand time and the preacher looks at the boy and says hey boy come over here so he rides the bike up and he says what's wrong with this lawnmower How, why would you give me a lawnmower that doesn't work he says oh it works just fine you see but but it's it's a weird kind of lawnmower because the way my daddy got it to work is you had to cuss at it the preacher said son i gave up cussing a long time ago and the boy looked at him with a big smile and he said, you just keep pulling on that string and you'll, you'll remember how in no time at all. <laughs> For all of us, we need to look up. We need to pull on the strings of heaven. We need to pull on the spirit of God. Not, not pull on the downwards, no, pull on the upwards. We need to allow the spirit of God to draw those things out of us. As we do, it'll just start to flow. See, sometimes we think, man, i got to try and be loving. No, you got to press into the Spirit of God. you got to get into the love of God. If you can have the love of God expressed to you, then you can express the love of God to someone else. Tonight, what did we learn about? We learned about upwards. The first of that being love. What is love? Love is personal self-sacrifice. It's giving yourself for the benefit of others. How do we love? We love like Jesus loved. We lay down our lives for others. Jesus was a giver. Jesus gave. Jesus came. Jesus served. Jesus loved. And as you go out, you are a representative of the love of Jesus Christ to everybody. Come on, can you guys just give the Lord a great big upwards <laughs> praise? Tonight, before we dismiss, I just want to take a couple minutes of your time and talk to you about your life. You've heard the gospel tonight. You've heard how Jesus came, how Jesus died, how Jesus was raised again to life. You've learned how God loves you. That God loved you so much, he didn't want to be without you. I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated during this time. Very rude to get up. The Holy Spirit's speaking, trying to talk to people. And if you're getting up and walking out, you're, you're being a distraction to others. And as well, I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. If you're not a Christian, if you're not headed for heaven, then you're going to go to hell. And I don't want that to happen to you. And so I just want to take a couple of moments, ask no one get up, no one leave. No one turn, you know, on your cell phone and start looking at social media or texting or anything like that. Listen, we'll let you go in a couple minutes. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart is right with God and that if you died, you wouldn't be headed downwards into hell, that you'd be headed upwards into heaven to be with Jesus forever. The one who loves you so much, he went to the cross. Listen, you're not a Christian headed for heaven because you came to church. I wish it was that simple. Sometimes we're foolish in the American church, and we think everybody that goes to church is a Christian just because they sat in a service and called themselves a Christian. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that just because you sit in a church service and call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. Any more than if I wanted to be an automobile, I could go and sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that would make me a car. Or maybe I had to go and fellowship with other cars, and so I went down to the dealership, and I sat with all the other cars, and I made honking noises and, and, and driving noises, all that kind of stuff, and, and I wore a shirt that had an emblem of one of those cars on my shirt and called myself a car and thought that made me a car. Listen, it doesn't work like that. Just a crazy guy sitting in the parking lot of a car dealership or just a dude sitting in his garage. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people think if they can be good enough or if they can, you know, volunteer enough at a church, they can help out and give their money to charities. Maybe they're, they're smart enough. Maybe they, if they can just quote enough scripture. Maybe if they can do enough prayers. Maybe if they can, uh, you know, be raised in church, baptized or christened as a child, attending religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school class. Listen, none of that will get you into heaven. This is not about your good works. I don't care if you sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions at your last church. Even if you got a membership card, listen, God is not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Does it matter your upbringing, whether your parents raised you in church and told you you're a Christian? Does it matter your place of birth? Sometimes we think that America is a Christian nation and everybody born in America is going to heaven. Listen, nothing could be further from the truth. This is not about the location here on the earth where you are born. But Jesus made this statement. He said, it's about whether or not you are born again. Now, that's kind of difficult to understand because we've seen that in Hollywood movies, television, books, and the internet. We've thought it to be some weirdo stuff, you know, some crazy out-of-control Christianity. But listen, let's not let the world define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us because this is the way to heaven. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Not all roads lead to heaven. You can't do whatever, whatever you want to do, and it'll get you there. You must be born again. There's one way. You must be born again. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Sometimes people say, oh, I just love God. I love him so much. Listen, there were people that crashed planes in the World Trade Center that said, we love you, Allah. Listen, wrong God, wrong kind of love. We heard what love is, personal self-sacrifice. And if you haven't yet given God all of your heart, laid down your life to take up his, haven't yet given God all of your life following him, denying yourself and following Jesus, if you haven't yet given God all, then I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it to heaven. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and pop my hands together. Bang. You hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that. Bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying something. You're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. People will see me. Yeah, they might. Well, listen, let's get over that embarrassment for a second because isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice, you can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God. And you know the path. That's the downward path. If you don't, give God all of your heart and all of your life. Or you can respond tonight by simply raising your hand, saying yes to Jesus saying yes to life, saying yes to the one who loves you. Now you're on the upwards path. You know that's what you want. And then tonight, I'll pray with you. A simple prayer to invite Jesus. We'll bring you down here together and we'll pray together. I want to just encourage you in your walk with God. It's that simple. It's that easy. Tonight, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? Maybe you're lukewarm in this place. What is that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. Why? Because in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Gross, graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? He's saying lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. So if that's you and I just described you right now, get ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're out watching my television, in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe, or even online, wherever you're at across the nation and around the world, it's this simple. Raise your hand. God sees. God's watching. Then we'll pray together. All right? If you want to be included in that prayer, get ready to get your hands up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. If that's you, thank you. There's one. God bless you. Who else tonight? There's one wise person already. That's you. Two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? There's six wise people. Anybody else tonight? God loves you so much. He's asking, will you love me in return? Will you say yes tonight? Start on the upward path. Anybody else? Real quick in this place, if that's you, just get your hand up high. If you know God's tugging at your heart right now, you want to be included in that prayer. Is there anybody else? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's about six wise people. Anybody else? Still looking around. Ushers, do you see somebody? Where are they at? On this side. Got you right there. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, number seven. Anybody else real quick? Just want to give you a moment. If you're number eight, nine, or ten, you should have raised your hand. It's not too late. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for seven wise people. Hallelujah. Okay, let's pray together. Get a hold of your cold purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight, okay? So let's all stand and welcome them. And let's pray together. You just come to the front right now if that's you. You raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Come on, right now. Get your kids, get your stuff, get a friend. Come on down, let's pray. Should have raised your hand. Just come to the front right now. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. There's still 
come and let's give him a hand. You can come too. Lord, come on, if you raise your hand, you should have. Come on down. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need Anybody else? Come on. Come on right now. Just make your way to the front. All right, listen, you don't get saved just by raising your hand. You got to receive the gift. And you do that through prayer. And I want to pray with you. And listen, we love you. Listen, you're amongst friends and family tonight. And if you can't walk a safe and friendly aisle in a safe and friendly church for Jesus, what makes you think you're going to leave this place tonight and live for him out there in a world that's just pitted against you? The devil's going to try and beat you from pillar to post and get you to back off of this thing. Tonight, I want to encourage you. Be strong. Listen, it's just a short walk. We're going to pray with you. That's it. Nothing weird, okay? Not going to do any ceremony or blood or anything. And there's nothing coming on smoke, water, any of that. Just prayer, all right? So I want to invite you one more time. We love you so much and we're excited for you. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, there's many more of you that need to come. Just come right now. Let's sing that again. And you come while they're singing that song. Come on. Come on. Just make your way to the front right now. I need come on. You. Every hour I need you, my one defense. Else? Come on. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. All right, well, thank God you guys came. I'm so excited for your new life in Jesus Christ. All right, I want to lead you in that prayer. If you raise your hand online, hey, you can pray with us as well wherever you're at right now, too. All right, I'm going to pray simple phrases, all right? Very simple things. I'm going to give God all your heart. going to give God all of your life. I'm going to ask you to just repeat those things out loud. Now, this is not a religious tradition. It's not about the words of your mouth. It's about the expression of your heart right now, okay? I'm going to give God all your heart and all of your life. going to be born again, brand new on the inside, okay? Tomorrow, you'll look the same, smell the same. You're going to be brand new, okay? All right, I'm going to start learning how to walk in the Spirit like we talked about so that God can live His life in and through you. Let's all bow our heads together. Let's close our eyes, okay? And wherever you're at, let's pray this together. I want you to say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me with your blood and give me a brand new heart and a brand new start with you, Lord Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came, that He died, and He was raised again to life just for me. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. All right, now like I said, we want to encourage you in your new walk with God. So right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel waving at you. Really good guy. He wants to give you some free information, some free literature. So if you just follow him right this way, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.